right, I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for bringing us all together here to, to study these messages. Lord, I pray as we start this new series from Australia, Lord, that we will um, that we'll, we will be enlightened by these lines that you are laying out before us and that we'll come away with a deeper understanding of, um, in this particular study, what exactly happened um, from a spiritual perspective when the shaking began at the end of August this year. I pray that we will see the, the connections that were made by, by Elder Tess and that we will understand these conclusions and exactly why these conclusions were drawn. I pray that we will see that um, the light of these lines should cast no doubt upon um, what happened and, and where we are, but should encourage us um, for the choices that for the choice that we've all made to be here right now, Lord, and to continue to follow the midnight cry. Lord, I pray that your your Holy Spirit would be here with us now and to give each one of us discernment and um, to help us to understand. And I pray, Lord. Um, that you would draw any questions to mind and that we would be able to answer them. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you for each person here. And I pray for those that might be on their way. I pray that each person will be blessed by this, by this study. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> okay. So I'll start out with the introduction. You guys, most of you guys have probably watched a lot of these videos. If any, if any, you probably watched the first one. And I think a lot of you guys who were, you, your camp meeting there, Kathy did a similar presentation. The one that she had was kind of along these lines, I guess. I haven't seen it, but it kind of, I thought I, I thought I saw something and it looked like, it looked a lot like it. Was that true or anybody there? She did, um, she said she was working on that study before she was doing the, um, the process, the, the alpha apostasy before that all happened and then all the connections started to come in. Um, maybe somebody remembers more explicitly what she said, but, but she was actually working on the portion that she did. Thank you. Okay. What, what was that, Victoria? Yeah, I think she was, um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, I think she was looking into the, the mindset. Like, um, I think there was a question that she had from the study she was looking at what, um, Elder Tess and Elder Parminder were um, studying, and she wanted to know more about it. So she, there wasn't. Um, she said that there wasn't no one looking into that, like on the mindset, or I think something along those lines. And so she said, "Why not? You know, why not take it on this study?" And so she went on um, with looking into it, and you know, the Lord blessed her with all that. Um, um, she shared has shared so far um in her studies and um i think um she did yes she did go through some of these she does touches on touch on some of the the things that elder test talks about in this video so yeah she goes over the um the first the first shaking you know um in heaven and all of that that um satan um that led to Satan's fall and stuff. So yeah. And the parallels of what she was reading were like not right. you could see the application vividly <laughs> just based on what we've listened. <laughs> you could see the ap application after application as she was going yeah. through. She was using Spirit of Prophecy volume one, correct? Um it was I don't have the notes handy. Anymore. Oh, it was Story of Redemption is kind of the main um the main one that Tess was using in this presentation. I don't know what if you're maybe you're talking about Kathy. I'm gonna pull it out because I'm I'm pretty sure it was Spirit Prophecy Volume One. SR, which is Story of Redemption, which was in this study, but I'm not sure. Maybe you're talking yes. about Kathy. Spirit Prophecy Volume One is what she was going through. Oh, okay. So that's basically that's like great controversy. Anatomy of the first shaking, and it was uh Spirit Prophecy Volume One. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll just read the introduction. So maybe some of you guys have heard this, heard her when she said this, um, but I, I think it's important. So she said, you may have noticed that we began with a prayer. I know that 
that may surprise some people. It is being suggested in various quarters that we no longer believe in the power of prayer. I want to make one point, very, uh, one point before we begin today's study. Before I was in the movement, while I was still a nominal Adventist, I heard it taught in those circles. You grab that mic, Elaine. That was really loud. Thanks. Uh, that sounds like... <clears throat> Um, so I want to make one point before we begin today's study. Before I was in the movement, I was a nominal Adventist. I heard it taught in circles that practice evangelism that you would commonly face. I taught in those circles that practice evangelism that you would commonly face is when you went to a Protestant community or a Protestant friend and you tried to explain to them our understanding of the Seventh-day Sabbath. You would lay out the Bible evidence for the Seventh-day Sabbath. And the Protestant response is, give me time, I need to go and pray about it. And what I was taught in the Adventist church was that, is that <clears throat> that response is foolishness. It's dangerous foolishness because it's their response that they're not willing to take, authority of the, take the authority of the Bible and the weight of evidence for the Seventh-day Sabbath. Instead, they use that as a backdoor exit to say, regardless of the evidence for the Seventh-day Sabbath, I'm not going to accept it based on your word. I'm going to go away, pray about it, and wait for the Holy Spirit to convict me that the seventh day, seventh day is the Sabbath. This is, there is one example, this is one example, and there is not time, and I don't think that we are contemplating responding to every misrepresentation that is being presented of our view, viewpoints of what we share. But I want to make that point because you'll notice bef before we began, we prayed because we believe in prayer. What we don't believe in is that when a certain heavy degree of evidence we would call the latter rain is laid before God's people, that a wise response is to say, I need to pray about it. The type of response is recognized within Adventism as foolishness on every other doctrine we believe in. And yet all of a sudden, those within the movement who are given evidence of a prophetic subject utilize the same Protestant response as a backdoor exit. Not only that, they don't just say, I need to go and pray about it. They wait, they wait for the Holy Spirit to tell them personally that it is the truth, and then they start finding evidence in such things as car number plates. That is foolishness. We believe in the power of prayer, but we believe that God demonstrates what is and isn't truth based upon prophecy, based upon inspiration being understood through correct methodology. I just give that introduction as we did pray to begin okay so she's making the point because um obviously the a lot of the people left are raising a lot of questions about the methodology that we use and the things that have been said and they're taking it's it's almost the same thing that we've been doing as christians for so long is we're taking the straight reading of something and we're saying that's what they mean and they're so they're making the same mistake that we've done as Jews, as we've done as Christians, Christians, as we've done as Protestants, as we've done as Adventists, they're doing the same thing within this own movement and taking exactly something out of a context without, without even taking the whole context and saying, this is what they're saying. They're saying not to pray. They're saying, don't read your Bibles. They're saying, if you, if you don't wear pants, you're going to fail the test. And so they're completely misrepresenting what it is that we believe. And so I thought it was an important point. Um, for anyone who may still be in doubt, they've heard some things that were a hard saying that came out in this movement. And, um, and if you're still questioning it, we need to go back and understand the context of what, what is being said, because there's a deeper message every single time that happens. There's a deeper message, um, something that causes us to either reflect or get shaken out of the movement. So um, I thought the introduction was important, but we'll, we'll start with the lines here. So we all know the current condition of the movement. We know that there has been a shaking, the greatest of which we have not seen before, before in this movement. This is my first response since that split really became formalized. So there are a couple of things that I particularly want to lay, lay out today. Really, it's just an introduction. I want us to remember, oh, by the way, you guys, you're not going to see the notes on the screen because I'm doing the board work thing again. And I'm still debating whether this is, works for you guys or not. Probably not. And there's also a lot of spirit of prophecy. So if you guys have been feeling like we've been neglecting the Bible and spirit of prophecy, you're going to get your fill in the study. Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of things that I particularly want to lay out today. I want us to remember before we begin, not, not just the current 
position of the movement where we are, the obstacles currently being faced, but exactly the time frame of when that happened, August 31st. It was the Sabbath, it was the final day of the camp meeting, and on that day, Sister Tess was ordained as an elder, and it was the first female ordination. Along with Sister Shaqueta, August 31st, that Sabbath, it was at night, the meetings began, and it was at that night that the meetings began with FFA, and they did not go well. Immediately, everything began to change. September 1st, the movement was divided and the greatest shaking we've ever faced began. I want us to remember the time frame for that, that those things occurred back to back almost simultaneously. In the German international camp meeting, a prophetic ar argument, which laid out in detail, one that has been in development since 2016 at our increase of knowledge, formalized at 2018, but it was laid in stone at the German camp meeting and that strong prophetic argument was about equality. And you can really see that in two different ways. There was a strong prophetic argument laid out for equality between male and female, and that was put forward on every level of life, function, and duty. Equality between male and female being the first point. The second point, equality in leadership, that there are now two equal leaders of the movement. One male, who had up to this point already been universally recognized as the leader of the movement and now a female to equal him equal to him and that is what was put in place with the august 31st ordination since then august 31st september 1st events started to occur one after the other that brought us to where we are today everyone is aware of the shaking that we are currently in what became apparent soon after september 1st is that there are now those rebelling against this movement and what, are they, what they are doing is really like a game of Jenga. So I don't know who's familiar with that game, but it's a game where you have all these prophetic blocks and you have all, all these little wooden blocks and they're all stacked in different formations pointing in different directions. And then as a game, each person takes a turn pulling out one, one block and waiting to see how many blocks you can pull out before the tower collapses. What those rebelling against the movement have been doing is playing a game of Jenga. They're taking a block out at a time and pulling and just pulling them out. And what they themselves do not see, and I believe that makes them makes themselves, I believe that they they themselves are not aware of the consequences of what they're doing. They'll make statements such as the following. The lines are correct, but not the application. And then they'll start cutting down that application. And they don't realize what they're doing and taking away the blocks. The entire structure is already collapsing. So even as you follow their progress over the last couple of weeks, as studies are coming out, from what they were saying at the first, they're having to remove more and more of the prophetic understanding. They're backtracking further and further because they're realizing, perhaps subconsciously, that as they remove one block, the tower begins to collapse and you have to remove another and another and another and it begins to fall. And they're attempting to use a certain amount of methodology. I want to give one example. <clears throat> we have taught about the events that are currently taking place between Donald Trump and Jerry Falwell and the Christian right within America. Um, and what we've taught is that from 1979 to 1989, you have a 10 year moral, major moral majority in that time. And 10 years of the moral majority begins at 79 and it dissolves in, in 1989. Then you see 1996 and Jerry Falwell goes on a tour of the United States <clears throat> from yeah, my notes. he goes on a tour of the United States and from before 1979 the Christian right within America had formed a close relationship with the Republican Party um, in 1996 that is formalized with Fox News so, and 2001, we line up, we line that up with the Civil War. Um, not just the Civil War, we line that up with the history of the 1950s, and we see in God we trust. The stones are crying out, and right now the stones are being called the dragon power. But we know that the stones have been crying out ever since, ever since Adventism lost their voice. In 9/11, the stones are crying out saying the church and state are coming together. 
in God we trust is a national crisis. And then we follow the progression of the Christian right through 2014, 2016, and 2018, leading us all the way up to 2019. And it's not just the prophetic way marks, it's a story. You can go into 1990, I think that might be the wrong number, is that the right number? Um, I think it might be the 1990s. 2004, 2005, and 2006, and trace one, you can trace one whole story within, within its context. This is what we call connecting a thread. This is taking a line, so we have our needles. <clears throat> this is what we call connecting a thread. So this is taking a line and connecting it as a thread through all the way marks and seeing the whole story. And the key is that if you're going to start the thread, the key, sorry, the key is that if you're going to start the thread, we recognize the 10 year history before 1989. And if we want, we can take it all the way back to 1798. But that pin that your thread must begin in is 1989. So if we want, we can take it all the way back. Oh, sorry, rereading the line. <clears throat> uh, 1989, the time at the end. So you cannot pick up the thread down in the history of, sorry, get caught up there. Um, if we want, we can take it all the way back to 1798, but the pin that your thread must begin in is 1989, the time of the end. You cannot pick up the thread down in this history of 2014 and we begin to say that in much stronger fashion once we started dealing with the world wars. And, then, and again, Elder Jeff has claimed that, that this is a great light, the concept of the opening up of an information war in the information age. When we saw 1989, the big bang of the information age, when we saw that grow and develop into what we now know, that, we've al what, that we're already in the history of World War I and World War II, but it must begin at the time of the end, the invention of the World Wide Web. Okay. Um, so claiming to thread waymarks, claiming to thread waymarks, what is instead being taught is that if we find Hillary Clinton in 1996, and we find her in 2016, and we say that we think she did something wrong in 1996 and we think she did something wrong in 2016, then that we've actually threaded a waymark. That's not connecting waymarks or building any type of story. It has to begin at the time of the end. Then you can start skipping, then you can't start skipping waymarks to build your story. So that's one example of what, essentially what they're doing in the other movement by backtracking and pulling blocks out. So the point that we're trying to make is that they're playing this game of Jenga. There's a certain amount that they think they can remove and still claim that the lines have been opened up by God. But once you start to dissolve part of, part of it, they themselves do not realize that they must come to the place where they reject all of it. And that's already, be, already starting to happen. And perhaps in another presentation, we might go into detail on that subject. All right. I want, us, I want to remind us of our reform lines, particularly the line of the 144,000. Over the last five years, we've had an increase of knowledge on those lines, particularly how it comes to our timeline and the fractals. If we were to consider that line, we see that it has five primary waymarks. We have 1989, 9-11, Sunday Law, Close of Probation, and the Second Advent. <clears throat> It has been likened to a hand. As the light has increased on our reform lines, I would suggest that they also have become more simple to understand. It can be likened to a hand with, with five fingers and four histories or spaces between them. So you could say 1989 to 9-11, Sunday. Uh, so you could say 1989, 9-11, Sunday law, close probation of the second event. Um, yeah, and then you could say plowing, early rain, latter rain, and harvest. Four histories and five key waymarks. So I want to remind us of those who have watched Elder Jeff's presentations recently. He said, 
My argument is about application, not about lines. The lines are sound. I don't have a problem personally with Boston, Concord, and Exeter. So we know that Boston, Concord, and Exeter are what gives us our uh, basically our understanding of each of the each of the waymarks, the key <coughs> waymarks, and I guess the minor waymarks. And it goes like this, and it's the repeating pattern that we see. And Boston always equals an unsealing. So in 1989, we've had an unsealing, 9-11, Sunday Law, Closure Variation, Second Act, uh, not Second Act. Um, Concord is an increase of knowledge, and Exeter is the formalization of that message. So he says, I don't have a problem personally with Boston, Concord, and Exeter, and a test. It fits. It is powerful. So there's an acceptance of this structure, seemingly. Let's just take those lines then. This is the line of the 144,000. <clears> uh, the five key waymarks and four dispensations. And we say it is the hand of God, the right hand, that brings his scattered people and gathers them. What I want prim primarily, I want to focus on the history of 1989 to Sunday Law. We're going to zoom in on that a little. And before we build up the lines of the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims, I want to remind us of the increase of knowledge of this message in Acts 27, which began to open up in 2016. Sorry. There we go. Acts 27 gives us, gives us some history, and it also zooms in on this history of 1989 to the Sunday Law. <clears throat> and I want us to consider the line of the second ship. It's the ship of Alexandria. And that ship of Alexandria begins its journey in, in Alexandria, which we place in 1798. Those studies have been in the record for many months now. But I want us to focus on this history of the fifth line. So just so you're not confused, this, is, this isn't where... The fifth line of Alexandria starts. It starts in 1798, but we're drawing, we're bringing it up and drawing a parallel here. So, um, so we're going to focus on the history from 89 to Sunday Law, and then we're going to expand on this. And this is the ship Alexandria from 1989 is the mark of Lassia. 1989 to um, Paul has was what <clears throat> the mark of Lassia 1989 to Sunday Law. We just expanded that line. It leaves it leaves the harbor of Lassia. Paul is there given a message. Then we come to Euryclidon, um, which is 9-11. The east wind strikes. They undergird the ship, and Paul is given a message. He gives that message to the ship, and they begin to look for land. A cry goes over the boat. It's the message to the ship, and they begin to look for land. Sorry, reading the same line over. A cry goes over the boat. It's the midnight cry. It's the 14th night of the voyage and they sound the cry. We identified that as the midnight cry. They spot land, they check the distance, they calculate time, and you can see the 2520 in that history, and then you have shipwreck. So this is the story of Acts 27, the ship of Alexandria. And at shipwreck, which we identified to be the Sunday law, the ship is destroyed. And we laid out the fifth line that shows Adventism as an institution that began in 1798 and how it journeys through history represented by this boat that's finally shipwrecked at the Sunday Law. At this point, they go to the, they, they go to the third group um, at this point here. <clears throat> and what happens? First of all, you have Paul, then in this history, um, the midnight cry to the Sunday law, he goes to those on board the boat, the heathen that are on board the boat, and then they go to the island. So there are three groups clearly within the final journey. And we can see on the line of the 144,000, as they still believe in this Boston Concord and Exeter structure, which is up here. Um, the message is unsealed at Boston, the increase of knowledge is at Concord, and it's formalized at Exeter, which means that between 9-11 and the Sunday Law, on the line of the 144,000, there must be those two waymarks. 
these two here, and a way mar uh, a message must be unsealed at Boston, receive an increase in knowledge at Concord, which is formalized at Exeter, and the two way marks that we have that we have between 9/11 and Sunday Law. At that scale, are the way marks of Raffi and Panium? Okay, that's what she's talking about. So, here, Raffi and Panium. Yeah, and the two way marks that we have between 9/11 and Sunday Law. Uh, reading that again, and we identify it on the ship, 1989, 9/11, and then this angel comes down, gives Paul a message, and that is the increase of knowledge. <clears throat> and oh, okay, so she's pointing out Boston Concord Exeter. Okay, so Raffi and Panium, I did have it. That's Raffi and Panium there, and then she's drawing it down here, and just so we understand on this scale that this is what it's going to look like. Concord is Paul's message that was being given. Euroclidon is the Boston, and the Midnight Cry is the Exeter. So we can see on the line 144,000. No, I already read that. Paul gives a message. The increase of knowledge at Concord is formalized when they spot land and they calculate time, which is Exeter. These are the these are the waymarks of Raffia, and that's Paul's message. And Panium and Panium, it says Midnight Cry. Um, trying to understand that. So 1989, 9-11, Raffia, Panium, and Sunday Law, you have your five key waymarks, the five fingers of your hand. So I want us to see as the line of the institutions shipwrecked at Sunday Law, Adventism <clears throat> would Adventism, going back to your fractals, then we end, sorry, this is, I'm reading this kind of in a weird way. So going back to our fractals, we then understand that there are three groups, not relating to the institutions, but to people. The first group is the priests, and they begin in 1989. Yeah, there we go. Um, and then they go through this history, and their line ends at Panium. Opinion. And you have five key way marks, the five fingers, and four histories. So this is the line of the priests, and they're harvested here between 2019 and 2021. So this is the line of the priests. Then we go to the line of the Levites, and they begin at 9 11. 2014, 2019, Raphia, Panium. Oh, what just happened? This is the problem of doing it this way. You make a mistake and you got to go all the way back. Bear with me. Good high speed review. Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. Okay, priests. All right, so we have the Levites, they begin at 9-11 and they journey until Sunday, Sunday Law. They have 9-11, they have 2014, they have 2019, they have <clears throat> Raffia, Panium, and Sunday Law. I think 2019 is Raffia, that's right, okay. So they're brought into the movement and harvested between Panium and Sunday Law. And I then have a question. Yep. Um, did you do that or did she? I can't remember her board work, but for her to put Panium and Sunday Law on the Levites and not 2021, doesn't was she trying to demonstrate a point or? She, she uh, put 2021. Is that what you're asking? If she put 2021, you mean? Yeah, but how come she didn't put it on the Levites line? She has Panium and not 2021 there. That's a good question. I honestly am not sure. I was actually, because we haven't really, we've used Panium more than we've used this number for a long time. And right. it, and then she started bringing 2021 back out again. So I'm not, I was wondering the same thing when I saw it there. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, because if she was trying to, um, you know, Put a point there, you know, for her not to continue it on the Levi's line. It's fine.
fine if she puts 2021 i'm i'm not saying anything about that but how come she didn't she used panium down there instead of just putting 2021 that's yeah i'm not sure there it's like obviously it's the same thing but right um yeah i'm not sure can't answer um so then we go then we go to the nathanum <clears throat> And we can see that they would begin in 2014. And we're not going to finish the reform line. I want us to focus on this history of the Sunday law. It's at the Sunday law that they begin to be brought into this movement. From 2014, they're plowed. 2019 is their early reign. Let's go through it. That is their early reign. Panium is the latter reign. The beginning of the latter rain and Sunday law to the close of probation is their harvest. Okay. The reason that we've gone and reviewed these lines is I want us to see that there are three groups. First of all, the priests, second, the Levites, and the third, the Nathanims. These are the three groups. Twice we go to the church and then we go to the world. We go to the world at Sunday law. As we've long known, if we go to the world at Sunday law, it's not until Sunday law that we go to the third group. This is the call to the world. One, two, three, call to the world. Um, before this, it's all the church. So I want us to see that this is the structure of our reform line. We have done, we have not, we have done not just, we have done not just the fractals, but also the ship of Alexandria to show that shut door for the institution up here. Um, and the reason I want to do this is I want to transfer this knowledge onto another reform line. I want us to go from considering the 144,000 to considering the history of Christ. If this is how we construct a reform line, how should we consider the, the history of Christ? We have four primary reform lines. <clears throat> um, we have Moses and Christ, and this is the alpha of ancient israel and you have an alpha and an omega and then you have a history of failure and then you have a history of success so we come to our time we have the omega history you have a history of failure and then a history of success we come to our line omega history it's the omega and it's the history of modern israel you have the history of the millerites and that's our alpha and it ended in failure and disappointment and then you have the 144,000, the omega, and that's the success. So we cut these lines here in between um, spot, the alpha and the omega histories, and we overlay them. But the reason I've drawn it this way, <clears throat> um, the reason why it's been drawn this way is I want us to be able to identify while we, we all have, while we all, while we have all these different reform lines, the primary example of our history, you could argue from one context above and beyond every other reform line is the history of Christ. This is the reform line that should above any other be demonstrating to us what ours looks like. It's a primary reform line. We can talk about Moses and the Millerites. They have their special characteristics. But when you look at the context of these reform lines, it's Christ that we're most closely re repeating. So when we come to the to Christ's history, what do we see? How many groups are called? First of all, you have the disciples. You have the disciples, then they go back to the church and then they go to the Gentiles. You have built within the reform line of Christ, the end of ancient Israel. You have three groups and this is the beginning of ancient Israel. This is the end of ancient Israel. The beginning of modern Israel and the end of modern Israel. Okay, so yeah, beginning of ancient Israel, end of ancient Israel, beginning of modern Israel, the end of modern Israel. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, but if we're going to understand the end of modern Israel, Israel, we could primarily go back to the end of ancient Israel to understand that. So I want us to take this understanding of the end of modern Israel and transfer it to the end of ancient Israel. So let's do that first. So we understand when it comes to Christ's history, we should expect five primary waymarks. So this is the line of the 144,000 over here. 
<clears throat> I just want to call this modern Israel. And to understand that, I want us to consider the end of ancient Israel. And we should expect five primary, primary waymarks. We understand the time. Um, we should expect five primary waymarks. We understand the time of the end as being the birth of Christ. Baptism, which lines up with 9-11. Then I want us to consider these three. Um, these three, this way mark here, Sunday law is the third over here. I'm trying to catch what she's saying. It's the third, it's the midpoint on the whole line of the 144,000. And <clears throat> what is its characteristic? Well, it's a shut door for Adventism and the gospel goes to the Nethanim. So when we see the end of ancient Israel, this way mark, the third, what should it be? Um, we know that this is the close of probation, and we know that this is the second advent. The history of the Sunday law to the second advent, I want us to put aside for one moment. It's the history, it's this history I want us to focus on between 1989 and the Sunday law. Transfer that to the end of ancient Israel, the birth, the baptism, and then what is the next way mark? It's at the Sunday law that the gospel goes to the world. So so at this way mark here, the third way mark, what must it be? <clears throat> we'll go to a quote. Oh, and if people have um, their Ellen White app, if you guys can get it out now, because I kind of want to make try to make it at least a little bit interactive, and we have a lot of quote reading to do. So if you guys have your apps open, I'm going to be, I'll try to assign names, because asking people to read, it just ends up with a lot of silence. Um, what do we got here? Great through the list. So Elaine, number one, if you can read, if you if you're able to, unless you're doing something else. Uh, GC for it right now, whatever you're getting ready to tell me. GC three twenty eight point one. Did you say BC? GC, GC great convert. GC. Oh, sorry, dog barking. Um, page. What page did you say? Uh, three twenty eight point one. Okay, give me a second. Yeah. And if Fergus wants to read, he can read. Yeah, I don't think he wants to read. But thanks for the offer. <laughs> 326. 328. 328.1. Almost there. I'm not that fast. It's all right. No, that's okay. I, I need the break. I have to put a log on fire. 328.1. The 70 weeks or 490 years, correct? That's what? Yeah. Okay especially lauded to the Jews, ended as we have seen in AD 34. At that time, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. Then the message of salvation, no longer restricted to the chosen people, was given to the world. The disciples forced by persecution to flee from Jerusalem went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Peter, divinely guided, opened the gospel to the centurion at Caesarea, the God-fearing Cornelius, and the ardent Paul, one to the faith of Christ, was commissioned to carry the glad tidings far hence unto the Gentiles. Okay. So at this way mark, <clears throat> which would be the Sunday law on the 144,000, it's the shut door for Adventism as an institution and the gospel goes to the world. So it's 34 AD, AD, and that's the shut door for the Jewish nation. The end of the 70 week prophecy and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. Um, does anyone have a problem with this reform line so far? You should. But if you don't, then that's okay. Because um, I don't really have, know how to explain the answer anyway. I just know what the problem is. Anyway, um, carrying on. Because 34 AD was the close of probation, and then you got close of probation. Is that what the, answer, what the problem is? Well, you don't see the cross anywhere on here. Yeah. And 
I think I, it, I guess it's, it's not in the transcript here, but I remember Tess talking about it before. So I'm not sure where she did these lines before. It might be repeat and enlarge. Um, I was, what's that? Sorry, I was thinking about that. Um, yeah, I was thinking about words across in there. Um, but would it be, um, never mind, I'm not going to say it because, yeah. I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so we're my understanding is, and I'm not gonna explain it very well, but this is one way of looking at it is that it's a story. Some stories you have certain information that is necessary, and some stories you have certain information that's not necessary. It's not to do away with the cross, it's not saying that the cross wasn't significant, it's not saying anything like that. What we're looking at here is the line of the 144,000. So these are the way marks that directly affect the 100. Uh, I don't want to. That's not the right way of saying it either. These are the these are the key way marks that these are the dispensations. Maybe that's the best way to say it for the disciples of the 144,000. So these are the key way marks for the disciples of the 144,000, and we're drawing the same parallel. So the cross is is very much important, but you don't see it on the line of the 144,000 or the, whatever you would call this here for them, but we will see it later on because we do find the cross down here. But anyways, that'll, that'll kind of come out later. So it'll make sense as we go along, I guess, but I, I can't remember how Tess explained it, but I'm pretty sure she did. Um, okay, so continuing to read. Um, Paragraph two, Elaine, if you're still there, maybe just read paragraph two and then I'll, because it'll be just quicker if you're okay. still there. Uh, let me see here. Thus far, every specification of the prophecy is strikingly fulfilled and the beginning of the 70 weeks is fixed beyond question at BC 457 and their expiration in AD 34. From this date, there is no difficulty in finding the termination of the 2300 days. The 70 weeks, 490 days, having been cut off from the 2300, there were 1810 days remaining. After the end of the 490 days, the 1810 days were still to be fulfilled from 8034. 1810 years extend to 1844. Consequently, the 2300 days of Daniel 814 terminate in 1844. At the expiration of this great prophetic period, upon the testimony of the angel of God, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Thus, the time of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which was almost universally believed to take place at the second advent, was definitely pointed out. Okay, thank you. Um, so, and then she goes, she's going into an explanation of the 2300 day prophecy, and it's at the point, at this point in AD 34, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of, C of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. Then the message of salvation no longer restricted to the chosen people of the Jewish nation is given to the world. And then she describes the work of Philip, of Peter, and also increasingly of Paul. So we're going to see this line at the end of ancient Israel. You must go from birth to baptism, 34 AD, close of probation, and the second advent. And focusing in on, on this history, what we would mark here, the Sunday law, a shut door for Adventism. Let me move some things around. Um, no, I keep losing myself in the notes. Um, 34 AD is the shut door for the Jewish nation. And at the end of the 70 year prophecy and the gospel goes to the Gentiles. So you can see that if we're going to construct a line of an institution from the time of the end, that the point where it passed at the point where it is passed by where its doors are closed is 34 AD, which lines up in our line as Sunday law. So when we consider Christ's history and we want to consider the gospels, what do the gospels become? They become relevant, relevant to a fractal, relevant to a fractal. I wonder if that was the right word. Everything that we have written within the Gospels, which 
regards the work of Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, and Pentecost, they must be primarily describing the experience of those, those fractals of the first two groups. So we consider the disciples. Oh, yeah, so that's, she gives a bare bones kind of fifth line for them because that's just where it's at right now. Um, so the closed door, here's nation, goes out to the Gentiles. Um, so from the birth of baptism, birth baptism, uh, birth from the baptism, then Jesus goes into the wilderness. He comes out of the, out of the wilderness. So we're looking at the first line here, the disciples. Birth, baptism, Jesus in the wilderness. Um, <clears throat> and then he begins his work. And his work from here at the baptism to the cross or the close of probation, uh, the test is, is the cross. The second group from baptism, we're just transferring our knowledge of the line of the 144,000 to that of Christ. The second group is the church. All right. And where are they brought in? It's not at the cross, it's at Pentecost. <clears throat> at Pentecost, the call goes out back to the church, and they're called from Pentecost to 34 AD. The Levites in this history, the second call to the church from Pentecost to 34 AD, and then the third group, as Ellen White lays out for us, they begin to be called from 34 AD. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. All right. And the gospel goes to the Nethinim. So the same, seeing the same thing here. And so we can learn a lot through the gospels of the history between 1989 and the Sunday Law if we bring them into a reform line. They're primarily describing the experience of the first group of the priests. So when we come to the history of the cross, the cross in its primary application is, wit is which way mark for us, for the group. For the first group, it's their test. For the disciples in our time, 2019, it's the test for the priests. The cross and its primary application becomes 2019 or raphia. We can revisit these reform lines and learn a lot from them. I'm wanting to highlight particular points so I can make my point. This is really just the introduction. So the cross, the test for the priests. Um, where are we at here? Down here. Uh, test for the priests. So question, prior to the cross, there's a cry, isn't there? And what do we call that on the reform line? <clears throat> on their reform line, catch up. They call it the triumphal entry. And this is the work of Jesus from 2014 to 2019, the work of Jesus to the cross. In here, there's a way mark that we associate with the midnight cry. And that is the triumphal entry. And how many are shouting Hosanna? Everyone is shouting Hosanna. Does Jesus know that those shouting Hosanna do not accept his message? Yes, he lets them anyway. He had lost people all through this history. He lost the 70, various had fallen away. But for the reform line of the disciples of that first group, when is their largest shaking? When is their great shaking? The great and final shaking of the first group, of the first group called, is that before or after the close of probation? It all happens before. The division between those who believed his message and those who didn't occurred before the cross, not afterwards. It's because the cross that you have, the rebellion of, because it's before the cross that you have the rebellion of Judas and those who fled. Um, I was wondering about that. I, maybe I'm not super familiar with um, those who fled at the time of Judas. Does anyone know anything about that? Say that again. The way she kind of worded it is, is it was, she says it's before the cross that you have the rebellion of Judas and those who fled. Is she, was she talking about the 70? And I don't know, I don't even... Know that I understand the seventy that fled. Not the seventy, which is before. The seventy is before. 
the 70 is um, John 6, 6, 60, John 6, 66, right? Okay. Yeah. That's She's right. talking about the rebellion of Judas and what he did. And then when they scattered at the time, isn't it that she's talking about that of, of Judas rebellion and going to the Pharisees and, and turning and Christ, betraying Christ. And then when the, um, the 12, I mean, sorry, the 11 scattered, um, as, um, uh, when they went to go take Jesus, when they, um, um, captured, I don't know how to put it. Uh, for that word, uh, captured Christ and went to um, try him and ultimately kill him. But yeah, they scattered at that point. So I don't know. If, I think that's what she's referring to. Gethsemane. Yes, thank you, Gethsemane. That's exactly what happened at Gethsemane. So. Yeah. So who you mean? Who who fled at Gethsemane? You mean after he was cat? He was taken captivity. Is that what you're talking about? No, it was, it was at that point where, um, where they run, you know, they run, um, the Romans come, Judas betrays Christ, Judas turns, um, he greets him with a kiss, and then, you know, all of that situation where they kind of fall back and all of that, and then they eventually just kept, they say, who's Christ, and they take him, um, yeah, that's, you know? So you, you are saying it was after he was taken captivity right after jesus was taken captivity and they scattered right at that right at that point so yeah it was kind of like after but it was like right there right at that point yeah yeah that's what i mean yeah okay um so the rebellion in this history occurs before the close of probation not afterwards it's before the cross that you see the division already manifested between those who do and do not believe his message <clears throat> i want us to consider this in more detail if we're currently, if we are currently in, and I think we can demonstrate that quite firmly, the last great rebellion, where can we go to understand that rebellion? If it's the last for the priests, where can we go? We go to the first rebellion, and it's the first rebellion that'll teach us of it. Um. So, lost my spot. And there's a spider trying to attack me. So, it's annoying. Okay, so what are we going to do now? We're going to put some elements of it down here. I want us to keep the con keep that concept in our minds. So I erase. Blah blah blah. She's erasing the board. Uh, so when we lay out the th three groups, <clears throat> trying to understand where the notes go on the board, which board I'm supposed to be on. This is the first. Okay. Might have to skip through some of this. It's kind of confusing. Okay. No, I'm going to read that. Okay, so when we lay out the three groups, this is the first, Raphia to Panion, the second, Panion to Sunday Law. I'm not sure what board she's on, so you might need to ignore what's on the screen right now. Uh, <clears throat> the third, Sunday Law to the Close of Probation. The third are characterized by the Nethanim or the Gentiles. So when we combine those two lines, we know that this is the mark in 34 AD. Um, if that's 34 AD, we can go back to the beginning of the Operation. Sorry, you guys. I'm just trying to figure out where I'm at. So anyway, she's just talking about, she's going over the line again. Um, and then she says, we, we've seen the hit that in this history that you can mark the triumphal entry so maybe i'm supposed to be on the screen yeah okay so she's overlaying it with the priest line here um you have your three groups you have 
34 AD, you have Pentecost and you have the cross. And then she says, very few are understanding and accepting his message. And then you come to the cross. You have the test. So I've just combined those two reform lines of the end of ancient Israel and the end of modern Israel. We've seen that the great division, the rebellion against leadership for the line of the priests or that first group occurred in, in this history right here. Um, before the cross, when Judas leaves the table and the disciples run away, if we're going to understand the last great rebellion, we need to go to the first rebellion. And I want us to consider that. So we're going to go through some quotes now and lay out what that actually looked like, the rebellion in heaven. And we're going to begin with the story of redemption, uh, page 13.1. So it's SR 13.1, and I'm going to pick somebody who's next. Chen Yu Leng, are you with us tonight? Maybe you don't, <clears throat> maybe not. Um, Christine, are you with us tonight? I'm here. What, what book? SR 13.1. SR 13.1. Okay, so does it start with Lucifer in heaven? Yep. Awesome. Okay in heaven before his rebellion hold on we're having we're gonna have technical difficulties are you guys hearing uh, feedback no nope, it sounds good okay great lucifer in heaven before his rebellion was a high and exalted angel mixed in honor to god's dear son his countenance like those of the other angels was mild and expressive of happiness his forehead was high and broad showing a powerful intellect. His form was perfect, his bearing noble and majestic. A special light beamed in his countenance and shone around him brighter and more beautiful than around the other angels. Yet Christ, God's dear son, had the preeminence over all the angelic host. He was one with the father before the angels were created. Lucifer was envious of Christ and gradually assumed command, which devolved on Christ alone. All right, thank you. Yeah. So the point that we want to look at from that paragraph is that Christ had the preeminence over all the angelic host, and he was one with the Father before the angels were even created. So from the beginning, there is equality. You have the Father and the Son, and they are equal. He was one with the Father before the angels were ever, were ever even created. So they're equal from the very beginning. The next quote we're going to look at is um, spiritual gifts, first spiritual gifts, 17.1. So 1SG, 17.1. And who's next? Is it? Christopher, are you able to get on the mic? By any chance? I know you can get on the mic. Yes, I'm good. Okay. Do you have access to your spirit? Your um. Um. Listen. Pardon me. Hello. Yes, I'm good to you. Do you have that reference there? Are you able to read um? Just the first paragraph on that page. Yes, I have it here. Okay. So, can I yeah, read it? It starts with, the Lord has shown me. Yeah, yeah. The Lord has shown me that the Satan was once an honored angel in heaven uh, next to Jesus Christ. His condition was male and ex expressive of happiness like the other angels. His forehead was high and broad and shone the great intelligence. His form was perfect. He had a noble and majestic bearing. And I saw that when God said to his son, 
let us make a man in our image. Satan was jealous of Jesus and he sent and he wished to be consulted concerning the formation of the man. He was filled with amid jealousy and hatred. He wished to be the highest in heaven next to God. I receive the highest honor until his time all heaven was in order. Harmony and perfect subjection to the government Perfect. of God. Thank you very much. Um, thanks. So in our first paragraph in SR 13.1, it says Christ and the Father were equal. And in that last sentence, Lucifer, it says Lucifer is envious of Christ and was gradually assuming command, which devolved on Christ alone. So there's already an envy. And then in spiritual gifts, it tells us when that envy begins. It says, until this time, all heaven was in order, harmony and perfect subjection to the government of God. So first of all, there's equality. And then there comes a point in time when the father and the, when the father and the son say, Let, let's make man in our image. Let's form the earth. And he brings Jesus into a private relationship with himself regarding the, the future work. And all of a sudden, Satan goes from this harmonious existence to one of increasing jealousy and envy. So, on the screen here. Um, okay. So there's, there we have here harmony. We have a secret meeting. Okay. So Satan goes from a harmonious existence to one of increasing jealousy and envy. So that, so this is the harmony, and then this is the secret meeting. And is it really a secret? Well, everyone can see what's happening. They can see that the father and the son are working as equals and Satan doesn't know why he has been left out of that partnership. And he begins to feel jealous. So this harmony begins to be corrupted. The father and the son begin to make plans. They begin to work together. And the working together is obvious for all of heaven. We said that we said the father and the son are equal. Sorry. We, we said the father and the son are equal. Does Satan know that they are equal all the way back here? Um, we know they're equal, but does Satan know that they're equal? Somehow this working together for Satan has come as some type of surprise. So the father and the son begin to work together and it looks like secrecy and Satan doesn't know why he's not a part of that. And, it, and it, as Tess said, she says that this causes jealousy to arise. Well, I presented this the other night on a different Zoom line, one for Canada. And we all, well, we all know Debbie here, probably most people. Debbie made a point because of the wording. Um, and just so we're clear on it, um, where it says that this causes jealousy to, to arise. Tess wasn't meaning that the father and the son caused Lucifer to be jealous. Just in case someone wants to take it out of out of its meaning, out of its context, and say that this is what caused him to be jealous. He had that jealousy inside. It was the mystery of iniquity. And we obviously understand that it wasn't the result of something that the father and the son were doing. He should have been quite content and happy with all that God had blessed him with. Um, but he allowed that to arise in himself because of what was going on. Okay, so next quote, we're going to read um, SR 13.2, which is just the next paragraph. So who do we have here? The Fell House. If you guys, anyone would like to read SR 13.2? I'm trying to look for it. SR 13.2. Yeah. Hold that. Eh. It starts with the great creator when you get there. Okay. And we're trying to learn how to use this, so bear yeah. with me. Yeah, no, no problem. SR 13.2. Okay. The great creator assembled the heavenly host, that he might, in the presence of all the angels, confer special honor upon his son. The son was seated on the throne with the father, 
and the heavenly throng of holy angels was gathered around them. The Father then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ, his Son, should be equal with himself, so that wherever was the presence of the Son, it was his own presence. The word of the Son was to be obeyed as readily as the word of the Father. His Son he had invested with authority to command the heavenly host. Especially was his Son to work in the union with himself in the anticipated creation of the earth and every living thing that should exist upon the earth. His Son should carry out his will and his purposes, but would do nothing of himself alone. The Father's will would be fulfilled in him. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I'm just going to read a small part of the next paragraph. It says, Lucifer was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. Yet when all the angels bowed to Jesus to acknowledge his, his supremacy and high authority and rightful rule, he bowed with them and his heart was filled with envy and hatred. So <clears throat> the envy and hatred had already begun to grow in Lucifer from the secret meeting from when the father and son had begun to work together in plain sight of the heavenly host. And Christ had been taken into special counsel of God in regard to his plans while Lucifer was unacquainted with them. Um, he didn't understand, neither was he permitted to know the purposes of God, but Christ was acknowledged sovereign of heaven, his power and authority to be this. Am I reading another quote here? looks like I am. Um, Lucifer, uh, okay. Christ had, was acknowledged as a sovereign of heaven, his power and authority to be the same as that of God himself. Lucifer thought that he was himself a favorite, a favorite in heaven among the angels. He had been highly exalted, but this did not call forth from him gratitude and praise to his creator. He aspired to the height of God himself. He glorified in the loftiness. He knew that he was honored by the angels. He had a special mission to execute. He had been near the great creator and the ceaseless beams of glorious light enshrouded the eternal, the eternal god enshrouding the eternal god had shone especially upon him he thought how angels had obeyed his command with pleasurable alacrity we are not were not his garments light and beautiful why should christ thus be honored before himself and sr 14.2 says he left the immediate presence of the father dissatisfied and filled with envy against jesus christ concealing his real purposes he assembled the angelic host. He introduced his subject, which was himself. As one aggrieved, he related the preference God had given Jesus to the neglect of himself. He told them that henceforth, all the sweet liberty the angels had enjoyed was at an end. For had not the ruler been appointed over them to whom they, for had not the ruler been appointed over them to whom they from henceforth must yield servile honor? He stated to them that he had called them together to assure them that he no longer would submit to this invasion of his rights and theirs, that never would he again bow down to Christ, that he would take the honor upon himself, which, which should have been conferred upon him, and would be the commander of all who would submit to, to follow him and obey his voice. There was contention among the angels. Lucifer and his sympathizers were striving to reform the government of God. They were discontented and unhappy because they could not look into his unsearchable wisdom and ascertain his purposes in exalting his son and endowing him with such unlimited power and command. They rebelled against the authority of the son. All right. And then if someone would like to go to 7BC973.4, um, who am I going to pick? The, 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 the Lucas family, whoever's on that one, Let's put a couple. No, they got one. Okay, seven BC. What again? Nine seven three point four. And then when you get there, let me know, and I'll tell you where in the paragraph because it's only the last half. Nine seven three point four. Yeah. Seven BC. Okay, I'm here. Okay, so in the middle of the paragraph somewhere, you're going to find it's going to say the influence of mind on mind. You start there and go right to the end. 
The influence of mind on mind, so strong a power for good when sanctified, is equally strong for evil in the hands of those opposed to God. This power Satan used in his work of instilling evil into the minds of the angels, and he made it appear that he was seeking the good of the universe. As the anointed cherub, Lucifer, had been highly exalted, he was greatly loved by the heavenly beings, and his influence over them was strong. Many of them listened to his suggestions and believed his words. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Thank you very much. So we want to note some characteristics here <clears throat> about Lucifer. Um, one of them is that he was highly exalted. One of them was that he was greatly loved. And he had a strong influence in heaven. Uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 36.1. Who we got here? Francisco, if you're around. PP 36.1. All right, can't find the mute button. Tell me again, what was that? 36 point, uh, sorry, PP 36.1. Starts with to dispute the supremacy. Yeah, that's the one. To dispute the supremacy of the son of God thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the creator had become the purpose of this pri of this prince of angels to this object he was about to bend the energies of that master mind which next to christ was first among the host of god but he who would have the will of all his creatures free left none unguarded to the bewildering sophisticated history by which rebellion would seek to justify itself before the great contest should open all were to have a clear presentation of his will whose wisdom and goodness were the spring of all their joy all right thank you thank you francisco <laughs> um so lucifer had a preeminent position or a position of authority. So we're going to put that on our list as well. And just to recap, the father and the son are equal at this point in time, but it's hidden. It's hidden all through, all through this history here. And um, up until God makes the proclamation and before, before angels were created, they were equal. Uh, before the angels were created, they were equal. There is harmony through this history as the angels do not yet realize, as Lucifer doesn't yet realize the position of the sun. The harmony begins to be disrupted once it becomes visible that they are working together in plans and operations that Lucifer is not permitted to enter into at the secret meetings. This begins to create jealousy in his heart. And it becomes to the point where the father decides it's time and is going to make a proclamation that Jesus is equal with himself and in authority over the angels. Um, so now you have, at this point in time, the ordination, and you have two leaders in the movement. Going back to SR 15.2, I'll just, I'll give this one a read. If someone wants to prime up for SR 16.2, um, whoever the next person is, we got. Um, Jackie, if you can prime up for uh, SR 16.2 and I'll let you know. Well, I, I'm on my phone. It's hard for me to get to that uh, uh, quote. Okay. Yeah, That's out. Thanks. All right. I'll just read through the, the two then. Um, so we have SR 15.2. So those who are, that are siding with the Father and the Son are trying to reason with him now in this history after the ordination. 
They're trying to convince Lucifer and the angels siding with him. They say, isn't it clear now? Couldn't you have seen that there was already, that there was already this equality? Couldn't you have already seen? Oh, that's, this isn't even the quote. Couldn't you have already seen they were equal? Why is there such a surprise now? To them, it's also new knowledge, but they can see it makes sense. And the position of Lucifer is no less profound than it was before. So she's talking about the, the angels that ex were accepting it. And SR 15.2 says, they urged that Christ receiving special honor from the Father in the presence of the angels did not detract from the honor that Lucifer had heretofore received. The angels wept. They anxiously sought to move, to move him to renounce his wicked design and yield submission to their creator. For all had heretofore been peace and harmony and what could occasion this, this dissenting rebellious voice? Lucifer refused to listen, and then he turned from the loyal and true angels, denouncing them as slaves. These angels, true to God, stood in amazement as they saw that Lucifer was successful in his effort to incite rebellion. He promised them a new and better government than they, had, than they then had, in which all would be freedom. So this is really eerily, sh like shockingly, similar to what had gone on, obviously. So what was Lucifer's promise? He was promising a new government. He was promising a better government. And the true angels are surprised as they see that he's actually successful in his effort to incite rebellion against the two leaders. Great numbers signified their purpose to accept him as their leader and chief commander. As he saw his advances were met with success, he flattered himself that he should yet have all the angels on his side and that he would be equal with God himself and his voice of authority would be heard in commanding the entire host of heaven. Again, the loyal angels warned him and assured him what must be, be the consequences if he persisted, that he would create the angels, that he who could create the angels could by his power overturn all their authority and in some signal manner punish their audacity and terrible rebellion. To think that an angel should resist the law of God, which was as sacred as himself, they warned the rebellion to close the rebellious to close their ears to Lucifer's deceptive reasonings, and advised him and all who had been affected by him to go to God and confess their wrong, for even admitting a thought of questioning his authority. So, is everyone doing all right? Any questions or anything on what we're actually talking about here? Anybody, I think there's a lot going on in the chat that I can't really keep up with. Um, all right. So there's a point where Lucifer, is, his reasoning has turned deceptive in this history. And if we go back to spiritual gifts 17.2, if, if, who am I going to pick on here? Lucas, Francisco, Jackie, Joe Laddie. If you have access to your Ellen White app, could you go to 1SG 17.2? Okay. 1SG. Yeah. 1SG 13.2? 17.2. Oh. One seven point two. And it starts it starts with it was the highest. Yeah, that's the one. It was the highest sin to rebel against the order and will of God. All heaven seemed in commotion. The angels were marshaled in companies with the commanding angel at their head. All the angels were astir. Satan was insinuating against the government of God ambitious to exalt himself and unwilling to submit to the authority of Jesus. Some of the angels sympathized with Satan and his rebellion, and others strongly contended for the honor and wisdom of God in giving authority to his son. And there was contention with angels. Satan and his affected ones were striving to reform the government of God, wished to look into his unsearchable wisdom to ascertain his purpose in exalting Jesus and endowing him with unlimited power and command. They rebelled against 
in the authority of the Son of God, and all the angels were summoned to appear before the Father. We have their cases decided. And it was decided that Satan should be expelled from heaven, and that the angels, all who joined with Satan in the rebellion, should be turned out with him. Then there was war in heaven. Angels were engaged in a battle. Satan wished to conquer the Son of God and those who were submissive to his will. But the good and the true angels prevailed, and Satan with his followers were driven from heaven. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Matt here. So we have rebellion. So we have an organization that's going on. And so who were they really rebelling against? Were they rebelling against the father or were they, or were they rebelling against the son? Anyone have a, an opinion? The father. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, that's what everyone said in the last group. They're, yeah, so they're actually rebelling against Jesus because they had no problem with the authority of the Father. It was when the authority of Jesus came in and the equality came in. That's where they had a problem. And you can draw that parallel. We'll see that a little bit later on as to what happened in the movement. Um, but wouldn't that still be the Father because the Father chose Jesus? So wouldn't it ultimately still be the Father? No, because they're they're rebelling against the decision that the that the two were co-equal, and you can see the jealousy of Lucifer was towards Jesus, not not anger against the Father, because he wanted to be the equal with the Father, so he wanted to be where Jesus was. Okay, because he just saw Jesus as one of the angels, right? You may have already said that. No, I didn't say that, but that's an interesting way of saying it. Well, that's what that's what Sister Kathy McGraw's um, presentation brought out. That why they call him Michael the Archangel because to from the perspective of the angels. And I don't know if you mentioned this. I apologize because I was doing a couple things on the side here, but um, he was the one that was over the throne with Gabriel mm -hmm. because that question has come up before and it came up um, in rescue is if if gabriel replaced lucifer but there's two angels over the ark who's the other angel and it was michael and so he was equal with lucifer and he didn't know prior to that that the father and son were distinct you know what i'm saying because he was at the level with the angels among the angels, just like he came at the level among us. Mm -hmm. Now oh, that's a really interesting point. I was almost going to dispute it, but you made a pretty good argument. Well, I, I, it was really fascinating because it really settled a lot of things in my mind. That's what caused the the jealousy because he was side by side with uh, Lucifer. He was the archangel, the head angel. They knew him to be the head angel, but they didn't know until after the secret meeting that that he was different than them and that's where the jealousy came in so i think that you know like people have a problem with this idea for one thing they you know adventism is one of the only we're one of the only groups of people that believe that michael the Arch archangel was jesus because they have a problem they 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 think that we ha we have these preconceived ideas about angels and so one thing I know the the argument that when I came into the Adventist Church is that Archangel means chief of the angels. It doesn't it doesn't mean necessarily that he was an angel. But now we have a whole different understanding of what an angel means. We know that in heaven there was cherubim and seraphim and and but angel means a messenger. Yeah. And so an angel doesn't mean you have wings and you know and everything like that. It, 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 because the Father has wings, and I assume Christ or my, well Michael the Archangel had wings, and they all looked probably very much alike except the, the the one distinction though is the covering cherubs had six wings didn't they yeah, I, know the one. I couldn't hear what 
I think so. That's yeah, because they covered their feet, they covered their eyes, and then they cut. They reached over the throne. It might be in Ezekiel too, but I, it's in Isaiah. Yeah. So interesting, like when you think about what these heavenly beings all look like. Um, but our idea of angels is, if you're especially if you're not a Christian coming from the world, it was definitely a lot of preconceived ideas because you just see pictures of angels and you know and you just see all the kinds of things that kind of mess up your your idea and i think most of christianity kind of hangs on to that and so they have a hard time accepting my michael being jesus but it's no it's very interesting that he was the other covering cherub when you think about it that does make a lot of sense yeah it, it was it was it kind of seemed to answer a lot of questions for me yeah like the equality that ellen white's talking about here or this the seemingly seeming equality between lucifer and jesus that the two of them were he, it's almost like he viewed that the two of them were equal and the father was on high and then the jealousy came when he realized oh wait a minute this other covering cherub like out of the three of us i'm the one that got left out yeah it's almost and that's why he he didn't have a problem with the father he had a problem with Jesus because Jesus was the one that he thought he yeah he thought he was equal to Jesus and the father was above them but then it turned out that he was the one that was lower than the two of them man it's almost like my human nature is telling me to feel bad for him in a way because he got left out of that but we have to understand that they were equal. the father and the son were equal from the very beginning and Lucifer was endowed with the greatest everything you know like he had everything and he should have been praising god for what he had but instead he was seeing someone who had something more and was looking it's like you're looking into your neighbor's lawn right you're looking over the over the fence at your neighbor's stuff and you're saying oh, i wish i had all that stuff and right behind you you have you know a family a house two cars in the garage and all that yeah. so yeah anyway so the guys, father and the son you guys haven't watched um sister kathy's presentation that first one that that's where she went through this as well and some of that stuff came up yeah might have to have a look at that sometime all right so uh the father and the son were equal before the angels were ever created there's harmony in heaven but during this period of harmony lucifer does not realize that jesus is in the position above himself and that the father and the son are equal until they start working together in a way that that he can't discern and he isn't invited into this work so this is obvious for the heavenly hosts but they they do not understand yet the the equality and jealousy begins to arise it comes to a point in time where god decides that he's going to make it official he's going to make a proclamation so all the angels understand this equality and he makes the pronouncement that the son is equal to himself and his voice is as equal in authority to the voice of the father and out of this comes rebellion and now it's all in the open and it's no longer a secret hidden in the heart the rebellion is open and all of a sudden there's a division that occurs and there's two groups of angels that are forming and there's a war in heaven until the point where they are cast out so lana if you have your app, can you go to Desire of Ages 21.3, DA 21.3? Uh, in, in heaven itself, this law was broken. Sin originated in self-seeking. Lucifer, the covering cherub, desired to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings to draw them away from their creator and to win their homage to himself. Therefore, he mis misrepresented God, attributing to him the desire for self-exaltation. With his own evil characteristics, he sought to invest the loving, the loving creator. Thus he deceived angels. Thus he deceived men. He then led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness because god is a god of justice and terrible majesty satan used them to look upon him as a, as severe and unforgiving thus he drew men to join him in rebellion against god and the night of woe settled down upon the world 
Thank you. So what is Satan doing with his deceptive reasoning? He's saying that it's God who is exalting himself. It's God who is preaching self-exaltation, therefore, or practicing self-exaltation. Therefore, he is misrepresenting God and attributing to God the evil characteristics that belong to him. Um, Lucifer. So this is the first great rebellion. And coming to our dispensation, we understand that the great rebellion that precedes the cross, which is 2019, is currently underway. And that's the great division. Just like in the history at the end of ancient Israel, now in the history at the end of modern Israel, the division occurs before the close of probation, not afterwards. So we come into our dispensation. And <clears throat> we have coming to our dispensation from 2014. That's across down there. Oops. And there's a new leader that's given his place, and that's Elder Parminder. And does anyone have a problem with that once that once that begins to be taught? Tess says that she's been teaching this, that Elder Parminder has been the leader of the movement from 2014 for months now, many months, really since at least the beginning of the year. And there's been no opposition to that teaching. No one had a problem. All was relative harmony. And from 2014, there's, there's harmony. Um, until one point in time when he begins to work with someone else. And that's... October of 2018. And already it can be seen in October that there are two people working together. And it's obvious, everyone begins to observe it, but no one understands what is happening. From this point forward, from August 2018 forward, it becomes more and more clear that there are two people working together in equality. But people still don't know that the equality exists. It comes to a point in time where it's going to be manifested and there's an ordination. <clears throat> this is at the German camp meeting and this is on August 31st. I think I'm jumping the gun on some of this, but whatever. Um, almost one month, almost two months ago or just over two months ago. And it's taught and enacted that there are two equal leaders of the movement. In fact, if you follow the lines of prophecy, how it's prophetically laid out that equality exists from 2014 and it's in it's into two different levels. So first of all, you have um, you have male and female, and they've been equal a long time, but it hasn't been made a test. It's hidden. That fact is hidden, and even as they begin to work together, it's hidden. Male and female are equal. The second point, you have two equal leaders. Um, Parminder and Tess. August 31st, Tess was ordained and it was taught, it, it was taught, said emphatically without a vote, that there is now two leaders of the movement who are equal, who are male and female. One is ordained an elder, therefore the other must be ordained an elder, and that is instituted. August 31st, that uh, ordination occurs, and Sister Tess, or Elder Tess, was not alone in that ordination. Elder Shaqueta was also ordained as an elder as relating to the United States. She was ordained alongside Elder Tess on August 31st on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath closes and we're, they're going to their first meeting with Future for America. And everything immediately begins to turn. The night of that ordination, everything begins to break apart. The next day on September 1st, everything split. FFA leave the venue and it all begins to be enacted. The employees begin to be fired. The bank accounts begin to be shut down. Passwords are changed. And the split has occurred. You have two groups, two movements forming. Why is it that throughout all this history, Parmenter's leadership is not challenged? In April, his leadership is not challenged. In June, his leadership is not challenged. Everyone's okay with it. They're okay with Elder Parminder, but it gets to a point that there's something occurring that they're not okay with. Um, Lisa, do you have your Ellen White app open, available? 
or are you even there? Nope. Okay, Susan, I know you're there. Yep, I'm here. Okay, can you read SR 16.2? Let's see. SR 16.2. Yes. Many of Lucifer's sympathizers were inclined to heed the counsel of the loyal angels and repent of their dissatisfaction and be again received to the, to the confidence of the Father and his dear Son. The mighty revolter then declared that he was acquainted with God's law, and if he should submit to servile obedience, his honor would be taken from him. No more would he be entrusted with his exalted mission. He told them that himself, oops, I just went too far. He told them that himself, and they also had now gone too far to go back, and he would brave the consequences. For to bow in servile worship to the Son of God, he never would that God would not forgive, and now they must assert their liberty and gain by force the position and authority which was not willingly accorded to them. And I have it in blue here. I don't know what the blue writing means. Yeah, read, I know, that, read that part. But I'll, I will read it. Thus it was that Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory, the attendant of his throne, by transgression became satan the adversary why is it switched does anyone know i i feel like i've heard it but i can't remember well it gives another reference there from patriarchs and prophets so i don't know if maybe the if the editors brought it over and thought it would fit there and they did they separated it got it maybe I, yeah. that's something I can think that looks right thank you you're welcome all right so so who's Who's the problem? So who is the problem for Lucifer according to this? Is it the father or the son? Again, it's the son. Um, I'll read this one. Uh, SR 17.1, it says, The loyal angels has hastened speedily to the Son of God and acquainted him with, with what was taking place among the angels. They found the father in conference with his beloved son to determine the means by which for the best good of the loyal angels, the assumed authority of Satan could be forever put down. The great God could at once have hurled this arch deceiver from heaven, but this was not his purpose. He would give the rebellious an, e an equal chance to measure strength and might with his own, with his own son and his loyal angels. In this battle, every angel would choose his own side and be manifested to all. It would not have been safe to suffer any who united with Satan in his rebellion to continue to occupy heaven. They had learned the lesson of genuine rebellion again against the unchangeable law of God, and this is incurable. Genuine rebellion against the, gen the unchangeable law of God, and this is incurable. Weird. If God has, if God had exercised his power to punish the chief rebel, disaffected angels would not have been manifested, would not have been manifested. Hence, God took another course, for he would manifest distinctly to all the heavenly host, his justice and his judgment. So in the battle that we're currently undergoing, you could call it, you could call it a war. And there's two sides. There's two groups of priests. And Elder Jeff has said to himself, there's two movements. He chooses to call them the Alpha Movement and the Omega Movement and us the Omega Movement, however you want to title it. There are two movements. One of them is forming under Lucifer, who's trying to reform the government of heaven. The other movement has from this point in 2014, from when you have the leadership established, it has two leaders. And what causes this war is the beginning of these two leaders working together and then the ordination of the second leader who prior to that had not been recognized as an equal in the government. Tiffany, if you can read SR 18.1. All the heavenly hosts were summoned to appear before the Father to have each case determined. 
Satan unblushingly made known his dissatisfaction that Christ should be preferred before him. He stood up proudly and urged that he should be equal with God and should be taken into conference with the Father and understand his purposes. God informed Satan that to his son alone he would reveal his secret purposes, and he required all the family in heaven, even Satan, to yield to him implicit, unquestioned obedience. But that he, Satan, had proved himself unworthy of a place in heaven. Then Satan exultingly pointed to his sympathizers, comprising nearly one half of all the angels, and exclaimed, These are with me. Will you expel these also and make such a void in heaven? He then declared that he was prepared to resist the authority of Christ and to defend his place in heaven by force of might, strength against strength. Thank you. <clears throat> so they meet. Satan unblushingly makes known that his problem, his dissatisfaction is with Christ. He expected to be the one that the father would negotiate with, to discuss with, to take into private conferences and reveal his secret purpose. Lucifer expected to be the one that the father would work with as an equal. Instead of it being himself and the father working as equals, he sees that instead it's the father and Jesus. And this is what causes his rebellion. In, in yeah, here on the board. So we have rebellion. That's up here first. Groups of priests or um, I'm really getting behind on my board here. Did we do that already? Maybe I jumped ahead too far. All right, so I'm going to read uh, SR 19.1. It says, Then there was a war in heaven. The Son of God, the Prince of Heaven, and his loyal angels engaged in a conflict with the arch rebel and those he united with him. The Son of God and the true loyal angels prevailed. And Satan and his sympathizers were expelled from heaven. All the heavenly hosts acknowledged and adored the God of justice. Not a taint of rebellion was left in heaven. All was again peaceful and harmonious as before. Angels in heaven, in heaven mourned the fate of those who had been their companions in happiness and bliss. Their loss was left in heaven. So we're going through a similar thing at the moment. Many of those who have been our companions in happiness and bliss have left and their loss is felt. We are in this war as we speak. I want to give us a key characteristic of Lucifer. And we will read Patriarchs and Prophets, and then we'll go to the Desire of Ages, starting with Patriarchs and Prophets. What time is it? Um, I'll go for, maybe we'll do, it's timed out exactly the way it was the last time. We'll do one more quote. Um, Sister Elaine, if you're still around, if mm -hmm. you can read uh, PP39.2. Not real fast through here, finding it this way. Oh, how, what, how do you usually Under find books? It? Oh, Patriarchs, Patriarchs and Prophets? Yeah, what, what, what are you using for your... I'm not on my phone, I'm in the CD room. So what, page, what chapter? Uh, I don't know what chapter, it's just PP39.2. Say the page number again. PP39.2. 39.2. Three, I'm sorry, three, nine, what? Point two. Point two. So 39. Yes, okay. 39 point two. I'm way off in the wrong direction. Sorry, my bad. That's all right. No rush. Yeah, and this will be good if it carries over for to give Christine some time. Okay, 39, two. A compassionate? Yeah. A compassionate creator in yearning pity for Lucifer and his followers, 
was seeking to draw them back from the abyss of ruin into which they were about to plunge. But his mercy was misinterpreted. Lucifer pointed to the long suffering of God as an evidence of his own superiority, an indication that the king of the universe would yet accede to his terms. If the angels would stand firmly with him, he declared, they could gain they could yet gain all that they desired. He persistently defended his own course and fully committed himself to the great controversy against his maker. Thus it was that Lucifer, the light bearer, the sharer of God's glory, the attendant of his throne, by transgression became Satan, the adversary of God and holy beings, and the destroyer of those whom heaven had committed to his guidance and guardianship. All right, thank you. So the name Lucifer means light bearer. He is the light bearer. And what are we, what are we in prior to 1989 as a movement? Darkness. That's right. We're in darkness. And what brings you out of darkness? Light. The light. The light bearer. The light bearer brings you out of darkness. And that was Lucifer's characteristic. He's known as the light bearer and the sharer of God's glory. He is the light bearer all through this history. And then it comes to a point where he turns from the light, from being the light bearer to the adversary, where he goes from Lucifer to Satan. So we're not saying he's the light bearer before, uh, at 1989. Um, it's just, it's what his role was. So we're going to stop there. That's the exact place to stop before. So we'll, we'll bring it into another night just so we don't keep, because it's another too long to finish. Um, does anyone have any points they want to make or any questions or comments, conversation in regards to the study or anything? No, it's a very good study. I have a couple of points. Yeah, go ahead. The, uh, the light bearer issue. Um, I was talking to a few people that have Sided with Future for America, and, and all they can say now is, "Oh, there's so much light coming out." Wow! And, and it's letting us see that you know, when when the closed door of 1844, October 22nd, mm -hmm. and how when Christ went into the other room, Satan assumed his position, and there was much light and power there, but no love, peace, and joy. So mm -hmm. we can see he's going to be deceiving them even after November 9th and giving them more light but it won't be true light you know i was wondering about that like i i i'm glad you said that because i had it in my head that like november 9th was going to come and it was like the, the whole purpose of that other movement was it was the midnight cry the purpose of the midnight cry was to separate the wheat from the chaff i mean it has a lot of other meaning and purpose but it was like god's final purification of the priests and i had it in my head that I, and once november 9th came that that was gonna that like i mean forgive me for thinking this but that jeff would die or something would happen and that the, the whole movement would fizzle out and they would basically just be in darkness but it makes sense because the same thing happens at sunday law doesn't it like i think with the seventh day adventist church even though the institution doesn't it come to an end but don't the i don't know how to explain it the the institution comes to an end but they don't attach themselves to this movement. They're, don't they just get caught up with something else? Regular nominal Adventists, like the ones that don't come in as Levites? They go and, you're talking about FFA, they go and unite with the, Judas went and united with the leadership. The leadership then went to Rome. Yeah, and the leadership went to Rome. Um, yeah, we're talking about that Sunday law issue too. Like, how is the verse that says when people come to him and say, Lord, haven't we done this and done that? And he said, I never knew you. You know, so they're going to, mm -hmm. some, some deception is going to be there at the Sunday law where even though it's not a Sabbath Sunday issue, there's something that they can latch on to and, and, you know, give themselves up as martyrs to, to find out it was the wrong issue. I don't know. Is that kind of what you're you're hinting at there? Well, I was thinking um, 
not so much the people in this movement, but nominal advocates, because it's something that they did. They separated from the group. They didn't follow the light. And like you're saying, they kind of continue on with like this false light. And I, I think maybe I'm, I don't have enough information in my head to actually substantiate what I'm saying. But when Sunday law comes, the, the same thing would happen with the Levites. The, Le or the, the Adventists that don't come in as Levites, it's not like their life comes to an end. They attach themselves to something else. They set up the image. They don't even realize that they really have the mark, right? They're, they're passionate about it because they're going to get to a point where they're going to persecute. Right. So they, they still go through that whole dispensation believing that they're getting light. Exactly. The same thing happens to them. And then it's, it's not until Christ comes that anyone realizes, right? Because um, what point, actually, what point, what point is it when they're crying out to their ministers and stuff like that saying, you knew the truth and you didn't tell us? Does that, does that take place after the millennium or is that? That's at the uh, close of probation when Michael stands up, right? So, so uh, because the plagues, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Plagues are falling out and they're, they're experiencing the plagues. So then they must know that they're lost. But I thought that even the people of God, they don't really know because they're still, still um, atoning. They're, they're still afflicting their souls through the time of trouble because they know that they're about to come before their God and they're afflicting their souls because they're still not completely sure. Is that right or no? Maybe not. Maybe that's an old thing. God I think. Are still afflicting their souls. I like think it, it could be, yeah. Because they don't know if they've actually passed the close of probation. The only thing that they, the only time that we know is when Christ comes and some go, some die, and then some go and raise up into the air. Right. Hmm. So, what'd you say? So, do you mean the Christ so th what about Panium then? You think everybody's going to know at Panium? Well, these are these are just doors, right? And we have to go through one door, but then we have to go, we know we have to go to another door. Yes. So at Panium, you know, we can, we can pass this door, right? We can go through this door, but then it doesn't mean that we're saved. We still have to pass through the next door and the next door, which would be Panium and then Daniel 12.1. No, I mean the false priests because it's our second coming at Panium, right? So they yeah. should know at Panium. Oh. I don't know. They'll be our enemy, I think. They'll be the enemy. The other group. Well, the yeah, yeah, like the the bad priests are already technically our enemy. Well, I shouldn't say that already, but. Um, November 9th but then um, Sunday law then you'll have two groups of Levites or your two whatever Adventists whatever you want to call them you'll have Levites and then you'll have regular Adventists that didn't go through I, I don't even know, remember what we were talking about now I lost my whole train of thought <laughs> <laughs> it's complicated stuff you're trying to keep everything in the right line yeah. You know, like, and make sense of it all. But we were saying the, the false priests would know that they're forever lost at, at Panium. Oh. Cause it's, because it's our second coming. So you, you know you didn't make it by the second coming. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying on a fractal level. Yeah, I never right. thought of that. Because we know that with the fractals, that only certain characteristics come down. But that would make sense. That would be the, like, because we don't, I don't, I was always wondering what the characteristic of the second advent was going to be. That we were going to see at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because I'm still under the belief that at Panium, the 144,000 know exactly who they are. Because Christ entered into uh, in a, another covenant with Peter at the, uh, what was that? Was that at Panium? Caesarea Philippi? Panium was Pentecost. Well, at Caesarea Philippi, he entered into another covenant with Peter. But Peter was there representing those who had heard the, the sound or the message of the dove. So they were there from 9-11 onwards. And Peter represents the 144,000, right? Because his name right. equals the 144,000. Right. So they'll know. We'll know at Panium. 
you know. But, so. Okay, but you can still fall away though, right? Because we have, we... Yeah. Like you're, you're not, are you that, sealed? That's the know? question right there. At Panium, how you, if you know you're part of that group for surety, how do you fall away at that point? Well, I guess if you're sealed, it means that you won't sin anymore, right? Like you're, it's not that you even have to try anymore. It's just that you've gained the victory, I guess. I mean, because, I mean, you wouldn't need an interest. What waymark is that? Pardon me? What Penny. waymark is that? Uh, Penny, Penny. Okay. which would be our second advent, which is our okay. next, that's Pentecost then, right? That is because Panya was Pentecost. Yes, it is. You'll be going through a series of closed doors, eh? Yeah. Yeah, like series of closed doors, but at some point, I guess we're we're sealed at different points. I mean, it's not which makes mm. sense. It's not that all makes sense. You guys have thought this through. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So the separation takes place uh, on November 9th between uh, tears, wheat and tears? No, the separation already took place. The, the, oh, okay. The, I mean, the probation for the priest is still open, but the separation happened at the split. That was, the, that was the, the shaking, the separation of the wheat and the chaff. But the probation closes in four or five days, whatever. And, you know it doesn't mean that people still can't cross the lines right we had they have until november 9th okay. and that's but the set the main separation of the overall priest movement has already happened and that's what that whole study was kind of talking about how it happens before not at the closure probation but it happens before oh okay yeah so there's no leftover like uh chef so november 9th everyone is sealed once in the well, I don't know that that's the seal because that's still only our close of probation in our second advent, or that oh. is the seal. You're right. I don't. I don't know. I <laughs> man, there's so much to think about. <laughs> I don't know. Lamar might know better than me, but I definitely am not. I feel like I'm shaky ground. What What do you think about uh, people in the group who are still uh, confused about pens and uh, uh, wearing pens and not wearing pens? Well. Uh, Mm -hmm. that stuff is part of the test right so this is ultimately what the close of probation is about for those even who are still in the movement so if right. there's if there's confusion yeah it, it, i mean i think it, it's up to each individual right i mean if there's if there's doubt mm -hmm. it means that you probably didn't accept the midnight cry i mean i don't want to say for anybody because it's really between mm -hmm. them and god but it really depends on why you are where you are that, it's not about how much you know it's about what you do with what you know and how much you had the ability to know if you know if you didn't if you didn't know as much as you could have known or you know and again god's the judge of that because obviously we all could have known more we've all had time that we didn't use to the best of our advantage and but god is a merciful god and the individuals that are going through if they're yeah. if they're still fighting the midnight cry i would say that's probably not a positive thing because we had sufficient time but again, every individual is a different person. Their situation was different. Oh. The pants thing, it, if you didn't understand the pants thing, then you probably didn't understand a lot of things, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because the, the pants, thing, a lot of people got really hung up on it and it was a big deal, you know, like I think people are still asking questions. I still have the odd one here and there, but um, yeah equality is what we're really looking at and that whole thing was about equality and it was pants was just a symbol of equality and right. if we don't recognize the equality then we don't recognize we don't acknowledge the equality between the two leaders in the movement that are currently leading us and those two leaders are representing the second and third angel i think on some level if i can say that you know. yes uh, yeah yeah so you can't receive this, you know, you can't have one without the other essentially. And right. so here we are getting tested on this, on these key issues, you know, conspiracy theories was a part of it because without conspiracy, if you hung onto your conspiracy theories, you couldn't understand prophecy. You couldn't understand Daniel 11. You can't see what is going on in the world 
right now because you're hanging on to things that were lies and you're and you're you're believing a different story you're believing things like that the government is out to kill you and you're not supposed to believe that because if if you recognize that the government is actually set up by god and it's being overthrown right now but you know things like the old conspiracy theories that told us that the united nations were going to set up a new world order and they were trying to kill us all with vaccines and you know you can go on and on and on about it you will not you'll never understand that the that the united nations was actually there to protect us you you'll never understand that even though you have a secular government the government was always supposed to be secular so you have people that are in support of gay marriage and and all these things like that that in our minds we always were so opposed to but this is the government that's protecting the liberties of all people. So your conspiracy theories will block you from seeing this. Therefore, you will not be on the right side of sexism and racism and equality. Oh. The same way that the Romans protected the Christian Jews until Jesus told them to watch for the abomination that causes desolation when it's standing where it shouldn't be. The Romans, you know, they were not nice people but they protected the christian jews from the other jews who would have slaughtered them if they hadn't left right before um, Jerusalem. Yeah. you know that was there was all kind of wars and horrible stuff going on and if the romans hadn't been there you know, the jews who hated the jewish christians would have slaughtered them so they are a yeah. protection to us wow that's i never thought of that connection before that's a good point yeah and it was a bit too so, uh, so what are we saying? The United Nations is on our side. Eh? Yeah, because is it sim they, symbolic or they are right now. But when Trump becomes dictator, right? Trump becomes a dictator. The United States goes from the sixth to the seventh kingdom, and right. and then when he's a dictator and Russia has fallen, there's no one to oppose the United States as this as the unilateral, the sole power of the earth. The United, United Nations has no army, so they will just succumb to whatever the dictator does because he'll just impose sanctions or whatever on them and cause them to do whatever he says. So right now oh. they're our ally, but eventually they're not going to be able to do anything for us because Russia, even though Russia is not a good guy in the whole thing, they're the only thing standing between they're only they're the only thing standing between us right now and um the greatest declension that's ever going to come upon the earth because they're keeping the United States in check because there, there's a balance there, right? Two superpowers and they're, you know, they're fighting it out right now. But when the, when Russia goes down, um, the United States becomes the United States Supreme. And then you have an overruling of the United Nations. And then it just goes on down that kind of line. So right now the United Nations are a good thing because Gorbachev in 1989, remember he, he had an idea of a new world order and his idea of a new world order was a good new world order. He wanted to see a multilateral system where all the countries of the world were actually operating together and keeping each other in check. But George W. Bush Sr. had a different idea, a different version of the new world order. And that was where the United States was in charge and the United Nations were underneath them. And that eventually came to pass. That's where we're at right now, just on the edge of it. Oh yeah, no! The I... same way that the same way that Islam protected the Christians when the, during the 1260s. I mean, yeah. they they kept a check on the papacy. There's always checks and balances. Yeah, that's right. We need those checks and balances because that's the only thing that keeps us balanced, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Okay, thanks. And now I understand. Good. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to think about. There's a lot to remember. Yeah. Um, anyway, we're well over time here. Um, so we'll be back, I guess, next week, and I'll finish off the rest of this. And Next week or Wednesday? Or Wednesday, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Tomorrow? Uh, Wednesday? Two days. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Okay. We, it's yeah. Tuesday here, so it'll be like tomorrow for us. Where are you at, Joe? Uh, we, I mean Fiji. Fiji. Oh. oh, okay, okay. Wow. John, how much more of the presentation do you have? Well, I'm. That's as, exactly as far as I made it the last time, and the last time, like I was saying before, what I did was, 
I, it really depends. I mean, if you have some that you can present, then I can make it so that I can finish mine up and then you can present some. If not, what I did the last time was I started at the beginning of Parmander test line again, and then I just went straight through to the end. Just, just as a re, uh, revision and then finished it off because there's still like six or seven pages left. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I forgot to put in the email about daylight savings time because, um, you know, for you guys in Fiji, I, I think I sent a private message to Sister Marioni because oh. I probably threw everybody off because they, I don't know who else participates in daylight savings time. Yeah, I was uh, participating. Uh, so it'll be on Thursday, yeah? Wednesday there, at the same time? Wednesday, starting at the same time. I guess what Elaine was saying, like, do you guys have daylight savings right. time in Fiji? Yeah. You do? Next week. Next week, next week. Oh, next week. So we're, we just jumped our clocks back on the weekend. Okay. So when we're looking at, I don't even know how to do the time change. So. Well, I, I know. We, we, we tell them right now that it's 8.14 our time, and we find out what time it is their time, and then we can do a calculation and know. They're about 22 hours. What, what time is it for you, Joe? Uh, it's like a quarter, quarter after four here. Quarter after four? So yeah. you're 20 and hours ahead of us. It, we're like a, a day ahead and five hours behind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you're you're going to turn your clocks back too. You guys turn the clocks back as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they do. He said next week they do. Okay. So that'll you'll have to adjust to that next week. Yeah. Okay. So you know what time it is for us. Um, right. It's like ten. I've got after ten then. Uh, yes. The, the, uh, uh, quarter after eight here right now. Quarter after eight. Quarter after eight. <laughs> And yeah, okay, thanks. And on Wednesday night, we'll be starting at six o'clock our time. So if you can figure okay. out the math, that'll give you an idea. All right. It should be right. six o'clock. It should yeah. be six o'clock your time. Yeah. Thanks. Um, would someone like to pray, and we'll close this up, and then. Any volunteers? I'll pray. Oh, I'll pray. Oh, okay. oh, go ahead. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful study that showed us if we resist the devil, he is not all powerful at all times and he will eventually weaken and flee from us. And so we take great heart and know that as long as we keep our eyes stayed on you, our hand in your hand, we can be more than conquerors through you. We ask that you would bless everyone here this evening. We pray that they got some truths that they can live by, and that can be like hordes to hold them up during this terrible shaking time before mm -hmm. the cross. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for our robes of righteousness. Thank you for your manifold blessings and love. Is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. That was a blessed study, Jonathan. Praise God. So, quick note on the schedule. Um, I sent it out in the, in the WhatsApp and then in here in the chat too. That we've got next week planned already. Um, one of the mini camp meetings that we're doing online via Zoom. It won't be at rescue, so we won't have the connection problem that we had at rescue. So, um, we've got three speakers uh, doing two presentations each. Actually, the Flugus family are splitting up between. Brother Lamar and the children. And uh, so that'll start at 6.30 Friday p.m. And then it'll go all day, five presentations on Sabbath. But we're looking to start booking in advance so everybody has time to prepare. I have all the dates set. I have to work with Sister Lisa just a little bit to make sure I have the cotton, because we need another Cottonwood, cottonwood um, physical location um, set. But but for the Zoom ones going forward, um, keep in mind if anybody wants to, I'm looking for December, I might have those covered. I think I'm going to do, I'm gonna, I might do two if people don't step up. Um, 
and uh, but but we need probably one other person, and then we're looking at going forward at doing uh, February and March as well. So the more we do it in advance, the more people, the more we get the schedule in advance, the longer people have time to make sure they're ready. So and then as it comes to November nine. Um, Several of us, I don't know if everybody here is or not, I don't know, we didn't discuss it all on Sabbath, but um, but several of us are going to be fasting. Uh, yeah. Fast when you want, but some of us are going to fast um, Thursday, Friday, and then Sabbath. And somebody had mentioned that, Sister White says something about we're not supposed to fast on the Sabbath. I don't know it, um, who, I think I've read that before, so I'll leave uh -huh. that for people in their studies. Um, I, I know I Go ahead. I think I read um, the opposite to what you're saying just this week. Yeah, well, good. Share it. Share it because uh, um, I know it kind of depends on maybe just depends on the context. But but yeah, I I uh, went for a long time without eating on the Sabbath just because it was just because I did. Um, but uh, anyway, so we're gonna fast. I'm gonna start myself Wednesday afternoon. I'll eat lunch and then I won't eat again till probably on the Sabbath, depends on what everybody else does. And then just lots of prayer that, you know, we for those that, you know, like um, Brother Joe was asking, I think it was him about, you know, what about things that people are still confused on? Go by faith in the things that you do know, mm -hmm. and the Lord will continue to open up that light. Um, mm -hmm. The problem that we see with some people is, is uh, they have a certain amount of knowledge that they understand and they believe, but the devil throws out a couple of doubts here and there. Um, things that they don't understand yet it takes away their faith in what they already do know. And I have learned over the years to hold on to that which you do know, and then God will continue to lead lead us through. So may we all um, get through this week and. You know, I think about it when it comes to what did Christ come to? Uh, uh, he came to do a lot of things, but I'm trying to think of the right way to ask this question. What did he say? And I think it's John 17. Maybe it's not 7, 17. But he, when he said he finished the work, what did what did he say when he said he finished the work that you did to me? What did he do? It's found in John. What's that? Is it found in John 17? Yeah, I want to say John 17, but I might be wrong. But when he says that he finished the work, that, that yeah, I'm pretty sure it's John 17. When he finished the work that God gave him to do, what was that work that he finished? I might be asking the question wrong. He came. Training, training uh, the disciples, maybe? The work of training the disciples? No, he. he Glorify the Father. What? Glorify the Father. Amen. Amen. That's the one I'm looking for. There's a lot of things, answers there. But he glorified the Father. So if that was his work, and you're going to see the living testimony, what is our work to do? Be the living testimony. To, to glorify the Father. Mm -hmm. On earth. And uh, so that's my prayer for all of us.